third one. Oh, this is even deeper. <laughs> All right. Pratyaksham apyavastutvad Vishwam nastyam aletvai Rajju sarpa iva vyaktam Evam eva layam vraja <laughs> What did he say earlier? You are detached from the entire universe first. Second, the entire universe is in you. Third, the entire universe is not in you. Now he's saying, Pratyakshamapi, even though it is experienced, you see it, you hear it, you smell it, you touch it, taste it, you think about it, you understand it, you struggle with it. Pratyaksham, it is experienced all the time. Yet, because it is, he says, avastu, because it is inherently empty. We'll come to that. It is, in Sanskrit, what is called mithya, false and appearance. Because of that, there is no universe within you. Amale tvai, in you the stainless, the pure, in which there is no blemish, in the blemishless the entity, in the, the reality which is you, that no universe exists in you. It appears in you. Look, they're not denying it. They're not denying you actually see the universe, you experience the body, you have a life, you experience it. Not denying it. They're just saying it's not real. It's an appearance. Then, Raju Sarpa Iva Vyaktam. It appears like a, the, that famous snake in the rope. It appears like a serpent in a rope. The rope is mistaken for a serpent. You, the infinite existence, consciousness, bliss, you. You are mistaking your real nature for this world. This world is none other than Brahman. This world is none other than you. You do not know that. You know, you know it to be a universe and people and a life of suffering and strife, ambition and success and failure. The little stories of each of our little personal lives. That's what we know it as. Pratyaksham api avastutvat. Though we see it, it's not real. That Swami under whom I used to study this I have told this story earlier again. I think I'll, I'll repeat it, but it, it's pertinent here at this point. He was in Gangotri. The Ganges is flowing past the Ganga, narrow and fast, and 10,000 feet in the Himalayas. And this television crew comes to take a picture, to take a video of the, of, the, of the Ganga. And because the Swami had not seen television, uh, they said, we'll show you TV. And they put a tel television in front of him, they cranked up a generator, focused the camera on the river. And the Swami told us, in uh, Hindi, he told us, Sab dikta hai matma ji, paani bhi dikta, ganga ji bhi dikti hai, kal kal shabd bhi sunai deta hai. Could, we could see everything, oh, oh Swamis, we, a group of Swamis were sitting around him. Oh Swamis, I could see everything. I could see the river flowing past, I could hear the gurgling sound of the water. I could hear that. Then I asked the director of the, of the film crew, the TV crew, Sir, can you give me a glass of Ganga water from there? Can you a glass Ganga pani diji? Can you give me a glass of Ganga water from the river? And the director laughed and he said, "Oh Swami, how is that possible? It just looks like that. It's not there. Dikta hai hai nahi in Hindi. It's very powerful there. It looks like that. There's no reality to it. And then the Swami, I can never forget. He looks. He looked very piercingly at us. You know, we were sitting at his feet." Oh Swamis, oh monks, look around you. There's towering peaks, glaciers running down, the forest, pine forests around and the river flowing at our feet. Look around, all this, it appears there is no reality here. It is form, it is sound, it is smell, it is taste, it is touch. Instead of seeing a two-dimensional movie, a three-dimensional movie, we have this five-dimensional movie playing before consciousness. There's no reality there. There's no substance. Nothing that will slake your thirst. There's a Tagore song. I think it's Dhananjay Bhattacharya's song. I, I've forgotten the uh, source. Anyway, the song goes like this. That sitting on the banks of the ocean of nectar of an ocean of nectar, sitting on the banks of the ocean of nectar, they die of thirst, O oh my Lord. They do not turn around and see. They scrabble in the hard sand, trying to get 
a drop of water to quench their thirst. They die there on that sand. They do not look around to see the ocean of nectar behind them. That's us. He's talking about us. Struggling throughout life for a little bit of peace, a little bit of love, a little bit of lasting, you know, profound satisfaction in life. No. We are, we are trying to get water from sand. The reality is within us, is who we really are. It's an appearance. The universe appears in thee. It's an appearance, it's not real in itself. Technical point here before I go on. Definition of falsity in Advaita Vedanta. What is, how do you define what is false? That which borrows its reality from something else is false. It does not have reality of its own. Who is, it's, it's like saying, who is not truly rich? Looks rich, but is not rich. It means credit cards. <laughs> you borrowed your wealth. I have borrowed my wealth from, from others. I look rich. I act rich. I buy rich. But I am not rich because it's all borrowed. So I am not truly rich. All that appears seems to exist. Its existence is drawn from Brahman, that infinite existence which you are. It's borrowed from the universe, borrows its existence from you and appears before you. Vivekananda says, things are dead in themselves. We breathe life into them, then either we chase them or we run away from them. It borrows its existence from us. That which has borrowed existence is defined as false. False is not non-existent. There is a difference between existent, false, non-existent. It's like this. It's a difference between telling the truth, telling a lie and keeping silent. Telling the truth is saying it as it is. That is the existence. That's compared to Brahman, the reality. On the other hand is not saying anything, keeping silent. That is non-existence, nothingness. But the false is neither of these. When somebody tells a lie, that person is actually speaking, is saying something, not keeping silent. Is saying something, but telling an untruth, telling it as, not as it is. Similarly, that which is false, the universe of appearance, is not non-existent. It is not truly existent like Brahman. It's a mixture of the two. It borrows its existence from Brahman and then plays out before us. So here is the point I want to make. A little bit of logic borrowed from a philosopher who lived 2000 years ago, Nagarjuna, the great philosopher of Shunyavada, the school of void, Buddhist voids. The logic goes like this. Hold on to the idea that the false, the appearance, the mithya, literally Sanskrit word mithya means false, is borrowed existence. Right? That which borrows existence is not either existent nor non-existent. That is the false. That which we cannot say it really exists. Brahman only really exists. That we cannot say it does not exist because it appears to us. How can you say it does not exist? It's not the truth. It's not silence. It's in between. You hear it but it's not true. You see it. It does not exist. So that which you cannot say that it truly is, that which you cannot say that it is not, that mixture that neither exists, nor can you say it does not exist, that is the false. Hold on to that. Now the logic goes like this. When you say borrowed existence, in normal circumstances, borrowing something is very simple. I mean, um, who borrows? The person who does not have it. Follow this logic, it's very interesting. The person who does not have something will borrow. So who borrows money? A poor person borrows money. Who is a poor person who does not have money? Borrows money. So the poor person does not have money, borrows money. It's simple. But when it comes to existence, the thing becomes very interesting. The question is asked, what sort of entity can borrow existence? What sort of entity can borrow existence? The truly existent need not borrow existence because it exists. Brahman, God, the ultimate reality need not borrow existence because it exists. And that which does not exist, non-existent, 
cannot borrow reality because it doesn't exist. How can it borrow reality? Somebody who does, a non-existent man cannot borrow money. Similarly, a non-existent entity cannot borrow existence because it doesn't exist. What, how will it borrow anything at all? It cannot do anything. So that which borrows existence cannot be ultimately truly existent, it cannot be non-existent. It can only be neither truly existent nor, truly, nor non-existent in between. That is the definition of the false. It is only the false which borrows existence. Borrowing existence is called falsity. If that sounds very abstract, look at the snake which appears. The rope is mistaken as the snake. That snake, its existence, the momentary existence which you feel, there is a snake there, it borrows that momentary existence from the rope which is its reality. The world of appearance borrows existence from you, the ground of appearance. Mr. Eckhart, the great mystic, Christian mystic, Catholic mystic, he called God the ground of the universe. God is the ground of the universe, on, upon which the universe subsists and upon which it appears, but in which it really is not, Ashtavakra is saying. And that ground of the universe, you are. Not individually, that one reality, you are. That's your reality. Third one. What is what, in one Sanskrit word, what shall we call it? Mithyatvam, falsity of the world, world, world experience. The world is an appearance. In what? In you, the reality. The fourth verse, the last one this evening, is a consequence of these three. Remember these three. Non-attachment, asangatvam. Ekatvam, oneness of the universe. You. Mithyatvam. The non-reality, the unreality, of the, the falsity of the universe which appears in you. First stage, you are completely detached from the entire universe of experience. First stage. Second stage, the entire universe of experience is in you. It's not different from you. Third stage, that which is in you, which appears in you, is really not in you. It's an appearance. Only that one existence consciousness bliss is, truly is. That's what you are. Knowing this, let this universe appear. Let the game go on. Let life go on. Birth and death, success and failure, all of them, let them come. Let the waves in the ocean roll on. That's the beauty of the ocean. The ocean is not afraid of the waves. The waves arise in the ocean, play in the ocean, disappear back into the ocean. Then what is the consequence? The last one, last verse. Sama dukkha sukha purna Asha nairashya yo samaha Sama jivita mrityu san Evam evalayam vraja